Uh, thank you very much, John, for your over-generous uh, introduction. Um, I want to share some ideas with you and then have a conversation. I know we have to break for chapel. Um, I think chapel is at 9.30, so I will make sure that I finish my remarks um, probably around 9 o'clock, 9.05. Um, even if I'm in mid-sentence, I will break off <laughs> uh, just so that I have a chance to have a conversation with, with you all. Um, I want to share some thoughts about world Christianity from the point of view of the world after 9-11, because 9-11 was really a turning point um, in the academic intellectual encounter with religion, particularly with Islam, but also a profound uh, internal reflection uh, among Americans uh, about the place of religion uh, in the new world order. And so it follows, it's, it makes sense that in the minds of many, 9-11 uh, um, is associated with the return, some would say unwelcome return of religion on the assumption, I think, that modern society has outgrown the religious habit and what remains of religion for us can be reduced to polite weekend ceremonies for the recovering few among us. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 signaled the triumph of the liberal West. Uh, leading Francis Fukuyama, for example, to venture a triumphalist thesis about the end of history and the last man. 1992, which was the title of his popular book. Few observers in that strain exempted Islam and the Muslim world from the new secular alignment of world order in spite of the Iranian revolution of 1979 and its widening repercussions around the world. After all, Europe could now resume its march toward a new dawn of freedom and prosperity unimpeded by the Cold War. George H. Bush had an intuitive sense of an unfolding watershed in the new world order, but balked at venturing a prescription for the shape it would or should take. In retrospect, I think his hesitation seems uncannily prescient in view of subsequent turmoil. From another direction, hidden currents were meanwhile stirring the waters of the coming global cultural shift that would not, it turned out, spare the West itself. And that was the assessment, actually, of Samuel Huntington at Harvard, who put out a sobering rejoinder in a book called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, 19. 96. That book tempered the heady confidence of Fukuyama and his secular prognosis by arguing that the new cultural fault lines that are about to emerge would in fact threaten global stability. The assumption of Fukuyama and others that the collapse of Soviet communism leaves Western liberal democracy with uncontested control of the field, Huntington argues, is false because there are outstanding ideologies that continue to contest Western dominance, including, Huntington argues, divergent and hostile religious traditions. Muslims, Chinese, and Indians, Huntington says, are not all suddenly going to fall into line behind Western liberalism. The more fundamental divisions of humanity, if I may quote him, in terms of ethnicity, religions, and civilizations remain and spawn new conflicts. The issue that in equal measure galvanized and jostled Huntington concerned religion, or more precisely, 
the reassertion of new forms of religious activism and identity. The issue of identity in terms of self-avowal of the individual and the idea of belonging, according to Huntington, is fundamentally a religious question for people caught in the currents of change and challenge. He says, religion provides them with compelling answers and religious groups provide small social communities to replace those lost through urbanization. In that sense, secularization acts as a mediation of religion rather than as a block of religion. I happen to actually have worked with Huntington at Harvard on a project concerned exactly with these questions for many years before he died. Huntington's argument has been an unexpected boon for political science. And in another book, The Third Wave, written a little earlier, he takes up the subject of religion in, in international affairs with growing confidence. By this and other indications, it was becoming crystal clear by the end of the 20th century that neither the rapid collapse of the colonial empires nor the surge of nationalist movements had been the decisive setback for religion that everyone expected. And it left observers in turn surprised and bewildered. A sign of the consternation was in the form of a letter I received shortly after I arrived here at Yale from the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow in the early 1990s, inviting me to a conference being convened by the Academy on the topic, the problem of religion. With these hints alternately of alarm and incredulity, the title, the subject of the conference was proof that the organizers were in what classical Islam would call a house between two houses or a stool between two stools, manzilla by the manzilla tain. Neither nearly as persuaded of the truth of religion on the one hand, nor on the other completely dismissive, for example, of the fact of the return of religion. A colleague of mine here at Yale said at least folks in Moscow uh, realized that that was a problem of religion, whereas his colleagues here in the United States didn't see that religion was a problem. <laughs> the facts, however, about the impressive um, surge of religion in the 20th century, late 20th century, and now are really impressive. The total world population in 1900 was 1.6 billion. Muslims numbered just below 200 million, Christians 558 million. In 1970, the total world population was 3.7 billion, with a Muslim population of just over half a billion, 549 million, and Christians at 1.2 billion. In 2006, Muslims numbered 1.3 billion and Christians 2.15 billion, including 1.3 billion Catholics. Buddhists and Hindus remain fairly stable with natural increase rather than conversion accounting for growth in those two religions. In 1970, there were 233.4 million Buddhists. In 2000, the number was just under 364 million. In 2006, 200, 382 million, showing an annual rate of growth of just under 1%, 0.86%. In other words, over 90% of the Buddhists were in Asia. And similarly with Hinduism, uh, the lesson to take from this is that the boundaries of these two religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, remain fairly stable. And that, in fact, was the conclusion of a study published by Encyclopedia Britannica. 
uh, it estimated in the 1990s that the conversion uh, rate among all the religions of the world was 25 million annually. 25 million. But of those 25 million, nearly 23 million of that occurs in Christianity and out of Christianity, showing that Christianity is the most dynamic religious boundary, uh, with more people moving in and out of it than in any other religion at all. Uh, Samuel Huntington talks about universalism as something that you would recognize when Muslim critics uh, argue that Western influence is tantamount to cultural imperialism. In other words, Huntington argues that no one is exempt from this universalism, even if they react against it. Uh, and that's very important to remember because it shows again how dynamic this Western frontier is uh, in which Christianity, at least for, for a very long time, has been the dominant religion. Of that 25 million, uh, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, 18 million convert every year into Christianity. And about uh, 7 million uh, convert out of Christianity mostly actually in Europe and to a lesser extent in the United States. The figures in the United States are affected by Hispanic Latino immigration. Um, there are now, what, 38, 40 million uh, Latino uh, South American immigration into the United States. A vast majority of that coming from a Catholic background um, with quite an active Pentecostal charismatic uh, flavor. And that sort of masks the decline of mainline Protestantism, for example. I want now to turn to Africa because I think it represents an unprecedented example of the expansion of Christianity, probably since apostolic times. Religious, uh, there are many paradoxes about the expansion, and so I just want to highlight a few of these features. It has been taken for granted that Christianity is a missionary religion, and by implication, a colonial religion. Well, let me give you some statistics to challenge those assumptions. In 1900, the Muslim population outpaced the Christian population by a ratio of nearly four to one. 34.5 million Muslims in all of the continent compared to 8.7 million Christians, 1900. And 1900 was a decade or more after the Berlin Congress of 1884 that inaugurated the partition of the continent of Africa. Historians call it the scramble for Africa. And a colorful anecdote makes the point. Um, Prince Albert, uh, still so enamored of Queen Victoria, decided to give her a wedding present. And the wedding present was Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Talk about selling the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> I'm going to move rapidly, 1900. 1960 began the independence nationalist movement in Africa, and therefore the beginning of the end of colonial rule and the end of the missionary era in Africa. In 1960, there were just under 58 million Christians in all of Africa, roughly divided among Protestant Catholic uh, about 50 million together, Protestant Catholics, the other 10 million, 60 million Christians altogether were divided between Coptic uh, Christians and Ethiopian Orthodox Church, 1960. Muslims, Muslim population of Africa at that time was just over 149 million. 
So the ratio of Muslims outnumbering Christians remained fairly the same, about four to one. <coughs> then what happened? Uh, the scholars sensed that something was in the air. I was living in Nigeria um, shortly after undergraduate years, and I was part of a seminar discussing the end of Christianity on the continent in the history department at the University of Ibadan, led by Nigeria's foremost historians, uh, Ayandele and Ajayi. I lived in a flat at the time. I was a tutor. I was teaching Arabic and Islam. And in the afternoon, I'd go off to the seminar, uh, where we would resume with Gosto the discussion about the end of Christianity in Africa. I would also go to the market to buy produce, uh, so my uh, cook could help me prepare some food. And in both cases, uh, I drove, my path both to the seminar and to the market was impeded by crowds of worshippers that had spent whole nights praying in the airport, in the fields actually, where the airport was situated. And I would make my way, bulldoze my way through the crowds, uh, fussing about how uh, I wish they would get out of the way so I could get quickly to the market and to the seminar in time. And when I went to the seminar, we resumed the discussion about the end of Christianity. In Africa. <laughs> These are grave professors, you know. Um, we didn't see the evidence. <laughs> we didn't see the evidence because the category was not there. <laughs> the category was not there. We didn't have a rubric for understanding what was going on, and therefore, when we were confronted with the evidence, it disappeared. It wasn't there. And don't, I'm not going to blame my colleagues. <laughs> I also didn't see the evidence. <laughs> I didn't see the evidence. And believe me, it took me more than 15 years after that event to sort of start thinking, wait a minute. Uh, but that happened many years later when I was teaching at Aberdeen. It's quite extraordinary, 1960. 1985, the tables started to turn. 1985, the Christian population of Africa had increased to over 270 million. And in 1985, Christians outnumbered Muslims for the first time in the history of the continent. Muslims numbered 216 million in 1985. Uh, habits, old habits are very hard to kick. And I remember uh, reflecting on these figures and being very, very, very skeptical. And I was attracted to the argument of my Western secular colleagues uh, who, you know, argued with these numbers and said they were meaningless uh, unless Christianity could demonstrate uh, an advanced, uh, higher standard of living, uh, better hygiene, better schools, better roads, better communication, the conversion, the numbers were meaningless. Uh, and I started to to fall for this until I remembered. But wait a minute. <laughs> Christianity arose in the Roman Empire and didn't prevent the collapse of the Roman Empire. And the collapse of the Roman Empire did not invalidate the teachings of the apostles. Um, so I started to, uh, to, to take back some of my skepticism. In 2000, Christian numbers increased to 346 million. It was clear that there was a massive continental shift on the way. 8.7% of the population of the continent was Christian in 1900. And what we're seeing now was that 30%, 35%, 40% of the continent's population was Christian. A continental shift was on the way. I have a Jesuit friend, a colleague, who 
uh, when Easter had to go back to Nigeria, where he'd been living and working for a very long time, uh, to do the Easter vigil there. <laughs> and uh, there was power failure, so there was little air conditioning in the church, and, and he wrote a letter, I don't think to his bishop, but he wrote a letter, he sent us a copy, in which he said he wished that many of these people who were coming to the Catholic Church to be, to be baptized uh, could go to the Pentecostal churches. Uh, he was running out of steam and out of room uh, for all these folks uh, who wanted to be received into the church. The numbers are, out, are just incredible. You cannot believe it. I met a forlorn bishop at Rome for the African Synod, and, and I said, you look a little bit despondent. What's the problem? He said, well, my diocese has multiplied, has grown so big that I cannot handle it. I said, I feel bad that I cannot visit many of my parishioners. They never see me, maybe except once every two years. Uh, and he said, 10 years ago, Rome agreed to split my diocese into two, so we have two bishops now, but now I have over 800,000 active parishioners. These are not just people on the books. <laughs> These are active parishioners. And he said, I cannot cope. I cannot handle it. So the problem is a serious one. I mean, growth creates problems. <laughs> um, but this is what has uh, really transformed the continent. If you compare this to what was happening in Europe and North America, the contrast is quite striking. In 1900, 82% of the Christians of the world were European and North American. Today, that has declined to just under 35%. 65% of the world's Christians are today non-European and non-American. And charismatic Christianity, or Pentecostal Christianity, has been the driving force uh, of this movement. Often, especially in Latin America, we see charismatic Pentecostal Christianity with a kind of Protestant and Catholic bias. But <laughs> a strange story, in Nigeria, uh, the leader of the charismatic movement was a Dominican Catholic priest, uh, Richard Farmer. Uh, who had experience in Latin America and came to Nigeria. And he used to fill stadiums in the 1970s <laughs> with uh, um, charismatic uh, Catholic uh, revival meetings. Uh, and then um, Paul Freston, uh, an English-British scholar, has documented uh, similar movements in Brazil and in Russia, uh, as well as Ethiopia. Ethiopia is quite extraordinary. I was there a few months ago. Um, I don't know if the figures are reliable, but I was in Ethiopia the first time in 2008, and I was told that the um, Lutheran church in Ethiopia had, I don't know, how many million, five million? Today, it's more than double. In four years, more than double. Um, 10, 12, 13 million beginning to rival Ethiopian orthodoxy. Um, so these movements are really quite, quite extraordinary. David Martin, uh, who is a great sociologist of this phenomenon in Latin America, has shown the prominence of women Pentecostals and how that has affected the machismo uh, male culture of traditional military establishments in Latin America. Female politicians are accordingly drawing on the energy of the charismatic movement uh, to effect uh, really major social change. The resurgence has coincided with the rise of radical Islam. And it puts different calculations on the return of religion. Uh, as such. Many observers uh, see a link between intolerance and strife on the one hand and resurgence and radicalism. Others see a civilizational threat in the return of religion. Max Weber observed that Islam is not a religion of salvation. 
And so he dropped it in his theory of modernization. Uh, my former colleague at the University of Aberdeen, Brian Turner, um, has written a book called Weber and Islam. He has since moved to Cambridge. And there he also puzzles as a sociologist as to why Weber uh, really dropped Islam in his explanatory scheme. It's very hard to explain Islam by the reductionist uh, approach of social science. It's very hard to do that. Uh, we have to remember, in spite of Weber, that Islam was born, originated, in what one authority calls a city of high finance, Mecca. <laughs> and Muhammad was a trader. Um, Islam was born in a city of high finance. So modernization and secularization is not going to weaken the appeal of Islam. And radical Islam itself seems to flourish by the um, effects of modernization. 9-11 uh, is a dramatic example of how radical Islam has used the tools and the instruments of an advanced Western civilization against itself. But there's also a deeper, kind of more sinister uh, issue here. Um, the effect of radical Islam is one effect, and anyhow, is to make us doubt the viability of our own values uh, and our own structures uh, on human rights, on freedom, on democracy. And so we have, in the United States, created laws to restrict uh, the civil liberties of citizens uh, in our attempt to respond to radical Islam. It's, it's uh, in a way, we have created elements of Sharia law <laughs> here in the United States uh, because of our fear of radical Islam. And I know some of these radical Muslims around the world, and they would say, yeah, the West is doing for us what we want to do to the West. Yeah. Uh, I lived in Britain for many years, and in fact, at the uh, invitation of the churches in Britain, I conducted a study uh, for the Conference of British Missionary Societies in the 1970s on Muslim immigrants in Britain. And I challenged the churches to say, don't rest on the hypothesis of secularization, which says that one successful, uh, the successful assimilation of one Muslim into British society means less Islam coming in. I said, I didn't think that as Muslims assimilated into life in Britain, they would renege on their religious faith, and therefore the churches have a responsibility to respond to the religious challenge, not just the social political challenge, but the religious challenge of Islam in Britain. Uh, needless to say, my advice was ignored. By the way, I often say that when I go to these meetings as consultants, I said I failed uh, to make it uh, into ordination or whatever, uh, and therefore I qualified as a consultant. Uh, you don't have to take any notice of what I say, um, which is often the case. Uh, I want to just summarize uh, and then invite questions. What are the features, what are the overarching features of this phenomenon of the Christian resurgence in the world today? There are several things that strike me as an historian as somewhat paradoxical. And I see this in relation with Islam. First is that Christianity seems to be the only world religion that is propagated without the language of the founder of the religion. Christians do not know the language of Jesus. They don't pray in it. They don't worship in it. They don't sing in it. And frankly, they don't care. <laughs> The Gospels uh, in the Koine are really a translation of the teachings and the preachings of Jesus. But Koine itself, as uh, F.S. Bruce, the New Testament scholar, and other writers have pointed out, is really 
um, a no man's Greek. This is not the Greek of Homer. This is not classical Greek. Uh, how astonishing. It led C.S. Lewis to say that the audacity of translation in Christianity um, expresses the audacity of the incarnation. Um, that the commonplace, the ordinary, the familiar uh, is assumed and taken up as the vehicle for the transmission of the divine message. <laughs> well, to Muslim years, this is scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. Um, the Quran is in the sacred Arabic and cannot be translated for worship and devotion. So Islam as a missionary religion does not engage in the translation of the scriptures. That is forbidden in Islam. We have translations. My own professor uh, in Beirut, um, in the German tradition, actually was involved with the German translation of the Quran. <laughs> uh, we have English translations, some of them very famous. But they are not the Quran, Muslims will tell you. These translations are not the Quran. They're not scripture. Uh, and yet Islam is successful as a, translate, as a non-translating missionary religion. Second, territoriality. Uh, Mecca and Medina are preponderant in Islam in a way that Bethlehem and Jerusalem are not in Christianity. And when the Christian West try to retrieve, to recover, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, it led to the tragedy of the Crusades. And this is the paradox I mean. Here we are, as a religious tradition, trying to recover the birthplace of the founder of the religion and finding ourselves at loggerheads with the teachings, explicit teachings, and the example of the founder of the religion. Muslims look at this phenomenon and they feel sorry <laughs> for Christians. By the way, that's why you have dwindling Christian minorities, ancient communities in the Muslim world, because they say, what kind of religion is it that cannot even, even recover the birthplace of the founder of the religion? And as a high-ranking Muslim official said to me in the Middle East uh, recently, he said, we Muslims recognize, we know that the Persons who hold the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem are not Christian. They are Muslim. He said, we know, we know that we hold the key to the peace of Christianity. <laughs> um, it's a very, very interesting paradox. These are the paradoxes. The other paradox, I've alluded to it in terms of the incarnation, the audacity of translation. When I came upon this, even though I was a Christian and quite happy with you know, um, scriptures in English or German or French, uh, I was still scandalized by, <laughs> by this idea. And I remember a missionary asking me to help them translate the Gospel of John into my language. And I remember my visceral reaction to that. Uh, who are these people? to think that my language is worthy to be language of scripture. Mm. I, I, I was offended. Now, and they were going to pay me money that I needed because I was going to school, and I couldn't care less about the money. Just the idea of it was so scandalous that I couldn't face it. And that's the third paradox of Christianity. That Christianity in translation picks up the commonplace, the ordinary, the non-sacred aspects of culture and assumes them into the mainstream of Christian life and devotion. The ordinariness of things that are very common and accessible to everyone are adopted and chosen as the means of the divine communication of the message. One lesson I draw from this is, uh, there are many things. First, that Christianity is invested in languages and cultures that existed for purposes other than for Christianity.
Christianity does not create its own separate language. It takes what is there and invests everything in itself in that. So in that sense, God has preceded the church in the world. God has preceded the missionary in the world. God was there before we arrived. And this radical turning of the elements of revelation in the cultures to which the church is called uh, is for me one of the surprising vernacular implications of the spread of Christianity. And finally, thinking of 9-11, I think it's important that we accept the importance of the Christian renewal process and the burden that carries with it for peace and for the understanding of cross-cultural, intercultural encounter in a world that's becoming increasingly divisive and increasingly alienated. Um, Christianity, I believe, is eminently equipped uh, with the task of intercultural, cross-cultural communication. I, I've said this not to you, but Muslim and all the Asian colleagues, that these other religions could come to Christianity to learn from Christianity how you not only respect other cultures, but how you actually affirm them as necessary in the divine dispensation. Thank you. I'm sorry. We have only a few minutes. So. <laughs>